What's up? Um, if I haven't met you yet, um, my name's Sam, and I'm going to be continuing our series through the Gospel of John. So if you're here last week, um, Phil uh, continued, well, recommenced the series after we had, took quite a big break, and we've reached uh, chapter 12. So the first bit of, bit of chapter 12, if you listen to Philip's sermon last week, was um, all about Mary washing Jesus' feet and the perfume and all that. So I highly recommend you read back and listen to Phil's sermon to, to catch up on where we're at. Uh, but now we're up to John chapter 12, and we are looking from verses 12 to 19. So if you've got a Bible, feel free to open up to that or follow along on the screen. Um, we're going to read that before we look into it a bit more. John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. So before we look into that a bit more, let's, let's pray again. Heavenly Father, please give us understanding from your word and be able to understand uh, who Jesus is as the King and let your spirit uh, grant us that insight. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2007, I was 13 years old and there was a lot going on in the world then, but it was the first time that I started paying attention to Australian politics. And if you remember 2007, it was quite an exciting year for us politically. We just had probably almost two decades of, of Howard's government and we would had the whole economic boom of the 90s, early 2000s, but Australia had reached a point where it felt like there was a feeling that we needed a leader for the 21st century. We had new issues that people seem to be talking about a lot. There's, there was like in, indigenous reconciliation, there was um, our relationship with China and how we, how we live in Asia properly, um, and carbon trading schemes and how we deal with global warming and all these new issues that were arising. And a lot of you will remember, along came this guy. That photo is taken straight from his Twitter bio. That's his current Twitter picture. Um, now, Kevin07 came onto the scene, and he was that leader that we were looking for. He went on Rove on TV. He, was, he played down ball. He could speak Mandarin. He ticked all the boxes that we look for in a leader. Um, and there was so much hype about him. I think that's why 13-year-old me started paying attention a little bit, because so many people were talking about him. He was giving a face and a leadership to our modern concerns, someone that we could get behind. And what happened with Kevin 07 is something that is reflective of what humans have done for as long as we can remember. We create hype around an individual, around a person, around someone who can represent us, and we follow them, we get behind them, we back them. And in a way, they could be prime minister, they could be any sort of leader, but they also are commonly referred to as someone that might be a king. And tonight we're looking at a king, someone who, unlike Kevin Rudd, overthrows our thoughts of what a king is meant to be, who subverts our expectations, who deposes all kings that have ever reigned, and who offers something completely different to any other human leader. So the first thing that we're going to look at is what's actually going on in this passage. There's a few contextual things that we need to figure out. Um, so I'm going to read the first three verses again. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. 
So this is happening in Jerusalem, and they're having what's called the Passover celebration. And this is when all the Jewish people would swamp to Jerusalem to celebrate their escape from Egypt. So they'd have the sacrificial lambs, have the whole meal together, and remember together what they went through when they escaped Egypt um, from slavery there. And it was a huge event for them, because about 30 years after this, the historian Josephus reckons that in Jerusalem, there was 2.7 million Jews in Jerusalem at that time. Uh, and that's not including foreigners that would be there as well. So in the ancient world, there's an enormous number of people that are all gathering in Jerusalem. And what are they doing there? Well, they're getting excited. They're picking up these palm branches, waving them around and shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So why are they doing that? Why are they picking up these palm branches and waving them? Is there any special significance for palm branches? Well, it's not actually any sort of Old Testament command. There's nothing that Moses was ever told about getting palm branches and having it as part of a festival. It's actually something, at least relative to this, that was a lot more recent. So in 164 BC, so about 180 years before this, uh, there had been this, this Jewish leader, a guy called Judas Maccabeus, and he had led these Jewish zealots uh, in a big revolt because they had been, the Jerusalem and Israel had been occupied by the Seleucians, who are this, this Greek group, um, one of Alexander the Great's generals who had been occupying Jerusalem. And uh, Judas Maccabeus led this huge revolt to take back Jerusalem. They'd been prevented from worshipping at the temple, prevented from doing all their sacrifices. And then Judas Maccabeus led the people, kicked out the, the occupiers and set them free. And this celebration um, that they had afterwards became, became known as the Feast of Lights, which we call Hanukkah today. And a part of that celebration, uh, at least in the early days, involved waving these palm branches, because that's, that's how they celebrated Judas Maccabeus as he went through the city celebrating his victory. Um, so waving palm branches was a symbol of victory. It was a, a symbol of victory over oppression and freedom from occupiers. And it's kind of a sign of what they thought Jesus was or who they thought Jesus was. Um, so that's what these people are doing. They're waving these palm branches, saying indirectly through what they're doing, Jesus is going to be a leader for us to overthrow these occupiers. Um, and then what they're saying at the same time is they're shouting out, Hosanna, um, Hosanna in the highest. And Hosanna, what it literally means is to save. And it's kind of, but even back then, it had evolved probably to mean more what we mean when we were singing it earlier, which is a praise to God, a praise of thanks even for, for his saving, for his salvation. Um, and as they're doing it, they're saying, here comes the king of Israel. Um, so the people, uh, as they're watching Jesus come into Jerusalem, are doing, doing two amazing things. By what they're doing, they're, they're demonstrating uh, that they think Jesus is this guy here to set them free from the Roman occupiers. And by what they're saying, they're identifying that Jesus is the king that's going to be setting them free. And that's why the author, uh, John, quotes uh, in verse 15, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. So that's from the prophet Zechariah a few hundred years earlier. And they're showing that Jesus is that promised king that promised Messiah that's coming to set them free. And why was it such a big deal for them that they needed this king? Well, they've, they've had quite a bad history with kings, the Jewish people, um, up to this point. They started out, they didn't have any kings. They really wanted one. And so God appointed the prophet Samuel to then firstly appoint their first king, which was Saul. And then they had three in a row, Saul, David, and Solomon, who are all disasters in different ways. Uh, Saul was a political disaster. Um, David was an adulterous guy that um, committed murder. And Solomon was a guy that um, took 700 wives and followed all these foreign idols. And things got worse and worse for them after that. But the thing is, there was this promise to the second of those kings. There was a promise to David. Um, and there was a promise that 
through David's family, through his line, a throne would be established forever. That through David, a king would come who would rule for all eternity. A king who was going to redeem Israel and a king who was going to conquer evil and rule the world. And obviously, generations have come and gone and no kings fulfilled that. Um, in fact, things have gotten worse and worse with their kings. But despite all of that history, these people are making a big claim about Jesus being that king. And it, we're not actually sure if they understand the full implications of what they're saying. Um, in fact, it seems to be because of, of what they're saying, they don't obviously understand the, what, who exactly that Messiah is because through their waving of their branches, they might have a bit more of an idea of a king who's going to come to save them militarily. Um, but they do have an idea that there is this king that's going to come and set them free. And that's what they seem to be celebrating with Jesus. So the first question is then, why do they think Jesus is that king? What, what is it that he's done that has led them to that conclusion? Well, we've just read a bit from John chapter 12, but if you look at that passage in context, it comes immediately after chapter 11, where Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, his, these people have seen his power. They've seen that this guy has the power to bring back the dead. And rightly so. They can see if someone has that power over life and death, he deserves praise. And even the ground where his donkey's walking deserves to be cleared um, and have some reverence. And they're doing it because they're thinking someone who has that much power, he's someone who we want to lead us. Maybe he could overthrow the Romans. Maybe he could overthrow the oppressive Pharisee leadership that we've got going on. Maybe he could be our next Judas Maccabeus. So that's why the disciples and the people are getting excited. And it's a little bit like us in 2007. Kevin Rudd was going to usher us into the 21st century. He was going to finally close the gap between Aboriginal Australians and all the disparities between them and settlers. Uh, he was going to continue the economic boom of the 90s and keep us wealthy. Um, he had all the appearances of being our best prime minister for years. And that's why these people are getting excited about Jesus too. Because that's what we look for in a leader. Someone who's going to sort out our problems. Uh, sort out our problems at a local, even a personal level, but also on an international uh, and national level. And Jesus has the opportunity here to cash in on this. He's got all these people that are following him, worshipping him. They've seen his power. But for some reason, he makes quite a big PR blunder. His PR manager needs a bit of work because Jesus has an problem with his image. Uh, if he was running for election, um, they might say, great message, but you need to work on your presentation a bit, Jesus. Uh, he has some elements of the appearance of a king, but he has some very basic things that he's missing to be a, a king that people would want to follow, which is our second point. Jesus is not what we look for in a king. Now, it's worth noting, Jesus never denies that he's the king. He's, he never tells these people, stop worshiping, stop worshiping me, um, stop singing these stuff to me. He's actually just going along with it, but he's presenting a very different image of what a king is. Because ask yourself, how would a king probably present themselves? Because uh, the obvious things that a king would do is come in, uh, if they're coming to their, to their city, is firstly, not be on a donkey. They'd be riding a big steed, they'd go through the go through the, um, through the city, take a seat on their throne. Uh, there'd be a lot of big physical identifiers that would make it obvious. They'd be riding a big steed instead of a small donkey. Uh, and a donkey in particular, it's so small, it was a servant's way of being transported. The master or the ruler would always be on the big horse and the servant would be on the donkey behind them. Uh, it's like a grown man being on a little BMX bike for tricks with the knees all the way up to their head. That's what it would have looked like. It was a servant's way of being transported. And Jesus consciously chooses this mode of transport. It was something that in the other Gospels we see he prearranged with his disciples to get the donkey. And he's consciously doing it 
to fulfill the prophecy from Zechariah to show that he is that king, but also to demonstrate the type of king he is. Instead of being a conquering military king who's here to show his power and his might, he's coming as a humble servant. He's coming on an animal that a servant would ride. He's coming in humility to serve his subjects. And it's important that he's not denying that he's the king, but he's showing that he's a different type of king for what they want. He's affirming that he's a king, that he's the king that God has anointed, not the king that the people have conjured up in their own minds. He's the king who's come in the name of the Lord. And that's kind of the opposite, I think, of what we often look for in a leader. I know that our politicians are technically technically called ministers. We have the prime minister, the minister for whatever, and all the different portfolios. And minister itself means the one who serves. But I think we all know that often the people that get into those positions of power, what attracts them to it is a search for power. Um, that's what often leads people into those, uh, into those ministerial roles. But Jesus here is coming as an actual servant, presenting himself as, as a servant. So that's one reason why... Jesus is not who the people here look for as a king and why we might not look for Jesus as a king. And there's another reason. Every king needs a jurisdiction. Every king has their palace, their land, uh, and an area that they rule over. But Jesus doesn't have that. Uh, and the reason for that is Jesus, when he first arrives, when he first starts his ministry, his first message is, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. And what he's saying is that the kingdom is present already. This, this kingdom isn't made up of physical boundaries that you can point to on a map. It's made up of people who are dwelling with the one true king. It's made up of people who are following Jesus. And when he came, Jesus installed God's kingdom. So if Jesus is this king, if he is the guy that uh, has come to establish this eternal kingdom beyond just the, the mere physical world, why isn't he the head of state of every country? Why isn't his face on all of our coins? Why aren't we all bowing down and following him right now? Well, it's the same for those people uh, 2,000 years ago as it is for us today. We don't want to follow Jesus. We want a leader, if we do want a leader, who can solve our problems right now. We want someone who can address our immediate concerns, whether that's introducing carbon trading schemes or leading us through the 2008 global financial crisis. Whatever it is, we want someone who can solve our problems immediately. And Jesus doesn't seem to be giving the people what they want. He's not seizing power, he's not making big speeches about overthrowing the Romans. And he's not fulfilling what they wanted the military leader to be. So we can see there's two reasons why Jesus isn't what we look for in a king. He doesn't present himself like a king and he doesn't have a normal kingdom. And the ultimate result of this is Jesus becomes the king who will die. Um, at the end of the passage, we see that the, the Pharisees are discussing how they're going to put an end to Jesus and his uh, attraction of all these crowds. And the Pharisees are scheming. Uh, they know their history, the, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, and they know that this guy Jesus is fulfilling all these Old Testament prophecies. But they don't want any part of that kingdom. They want to destroy that kingdom and they put a plan in place, ultimately, which three days after this is going to put Jesus to death. But then how do they turn the people against Jesus? Because he's obviously got a whole lot of followers here. How in a couple of days do they all turn on him? And within two days, these same people are screaming out for the death of Jesus. Well, it's because Jesus didn't fulfill what they wanted. They wanted a guy who would be fulfilling their immediate needs, who would be driving out the occupiers, 
be establishing Israel and doing exactly what they wanted to do. They had their own private agenda in coming to Jesus. And that's perhaps a lesson for us who come to Jesus in making demands and us being upset when he doesn't do exactly what we want. Jesus wasn't denying that he was their king. He was actually affirming that he was their king. But he was the king that God had anointed and not the king that they had created in their minds. So that's why the Pharisees didn't want Jesus to be king and then the people ultimately turn on him and have him killed. So, what does that mean for us then today? In Kevin 07's situation, he ruled for three more years and eventually it came out all this, these revelations from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet of bullying within uh, his office. And um, there was, a, because of that, he lost the trust of the Labor Party. Nothing could, was passing through the Senate because no one in the Senate was backing any of his moves. Uh, his opinion polls absolutely plummeted and he was ousted by his own party um, when Gillard overtook him in 2010. He made an attempted comeback in 2013, uh, but Australia had made up their mind by then. We didn't want him as our leader anymore. And why did we turn on him? Well, it's because we had seen his true self. Uh, with his time in power, he'd done some good things, but he'd done some things as well to see his true character come through. And Australians turned on that. And that's the same with all humans, human leaders in all of our history. They've all let us down at some point, and they've always failed. But when we see Jesus as a king, he's fundamentally different from all other leaders, from all other kings. He's a king who comes to heal and restore and forgive. He's a king who comes to literally die for his people. And not only that, he's a king who is coming back. The same author of this book, John, wrote the, the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And uh, in that, he has this prophecy uh, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 where it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress in the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of King and Lord of Lords. So this king is going to return and it's going to be obvious to everyone, not just Old Testament experts that recognize prophecies from Zechariah, but he's going to come on a horse this time. And he's going to come with an army behind him. Uh, and all nations, all kings, all presidents, all prime ministers will be subject to him. And he's going to be wearing this robe dipped in blood, soaked in his own blood. Because this king has already won victory through his blood being spilled on the cross. This servant king has already sacrificed his life for his people. And this king king is coming back and we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Firstly, am I treating Jesus as just someone who can solve my problems? As another figure who can solve my family problems, my work problems, financial issues, or even slightly bigger, am I just treating Jesus as a political figure? Because it is true, Jesus comes and he transforms human lives. When we know God, we know his love, and that changes us. And that changes how we interact with the whole world. It does transform lives, it transforms families, it transforms communities to know God and to know his love. But that doesn't mean that coming to Jesus means that life is suddenly easy. Uh, or that we'll be suddenly rich and comfortable. In fact, the opposite is quite true. If you choose to follow a king that rode a donkey and got crucified... What will it be like for his followers? 
Second question we need to ask ourselves, am I just treating Jesus as a solution to my immediate problems or can I see that his kingdom is much bigger than that? Can I see that he is a kingdom, he is a king with a kingdom that's much bigger than my immediate world? He's a king who's going to reign for eternity, who conquers all evil and sin, a servant king who comes riding on a donkey to serve his people and save his people. And if you're someone who calls Jesus your king, what does that mean for you? What does it mean to be his subject? Am I faithfully following him as king? What does it mean to emulate him, to serve in the way that he served, to sacrifice sacrifice ourselves for others, to serve in humility the way that he's demonstrated he is as a king? Let's ask God to help us serve in that way. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is king and that he is a king for for all eternity Uh, and that through him and through his service and his sacrifice, we can be a part of that eternal kingdom, that that you will be reigning forever and that we get to be a part of us, part of that. We thank you for that, Father, and please help us to to serve uh, and to follow your model uh, in serving those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.